Welcome to Ear Biscuits. I'm Rhett. And I'm Link. Joining us today at the round table of dim lighting is the creator of one of the most popular songs the internet has ever heard, Chocolate Rain. Mm -hmm. That's right, Tezande. Now, if you had a computer in 2007, or at least a library card that allowed you to go to the internet section of your local library, <laughs> you remember Chocolate Rain. This video went viral back in that summer and immediately propelled Tay to the Internet Hall of Fame. Uh, he quickly became the subject of parodies, tributes, remixes. Everybody wanted a piece of that sweet Chocolate Rain. And today, nearly eight years later, Chocolate Rain has racked up over 100 million views. And for those of you who didn't have a computer or a library card in 2007, yep. uh, I'm gonna give you a refresher. I, I know you've seen Chocolate Rain since then, but I just want to describe it because it's even fun to just describe it. To have it wash over you, yeah. so to speak. <laughs> even without even seeing it. In Chocolate Rain, uh, the sapia colored video portrays Tay wearing a white t-shirt and singing in a microphone with his signature deep voice. Uh, there's occasional cuts to Tay playing the keyboard, and every once in a while, he, according to the text that he placed on the screen, quote, moves away from the mic to breathe in. Mm -hmm. Chocolate Rain is a staple in the internet pantry, people. Um, not pantry people, I was I was referring to- In the uh, pantry, pe comma, comma, people. Comma, people. Um, he's created a kind of online nostalgia, really, that immediately transports you back to the moment you first heard Chocolate Rain. Mm -hmm. It's like when- um, I don't know, when like uh, JFK died for like our parents or something? Or when you had your first child. Or that. Mm -hmm. Kind of like that, it's kind of like having a baby listening to this song. I'm gonna transport you there again right now. Chocolate rain, some stay dry and others feel the pain. Chocolate rain, a baby born will die before the sin. Chocolate rain. The school books say it can't be here again. Chocolate rain. The prisons make you wonder where it went. Chocolate rain. Build a tent and say the world is dry. Chocolate rain. Zoom the camera out and see the light. Chocolate rain. Now the craze over chocolate rain eventually faded. But Tay has continued to maintain a career in web video for the past eight years and learning to ride that wave of chocolate rain that wave of chocolate rain, you uh -huh. get that? I'm gonna use as many of those uh, analogies as the fact that it's just rain, it's water, it washes over you, you can ride the wave. Just it, help me out, I'm gonna, I mean, I'm gonna sprinkle you with it. it I, you can drink it in. The ocean Suck is, it down. Is, a, is a wave, it's not, I, do rain, does rain, rain come in waves? It can if they get enough of it. Anyway. It comes in sheets, the but sheet, not in waves. He learned to ride the sheet of chocolate <laughs> rain. Uh, that led him on a really interesting journey into what it's like to be known so well for something that became unintentionally huge. And we talked to him about what it's like to build a career on a moment like that. Yeah, we also talked to Tay about his life before the sheets of Chocolate Rain, uh, how he suffered from severe anxiety, agoraphobia, and went many years essentially being a mute. Um, we talked about the creation of Chocolate Rain and how he handled all the craze and instant fame including our interview with him back in 2007. Yeah. Uh, we also talked about how he perceives people's perception of him. Perception inception. Oh. It, it gets psychological. And I, I think I, we both said the word fascinating. Fascinating. About like, we, we, like multiple times during our conversation with Tay because you know what? It was fascinating. It is. I wasn't doing a Spock impression. You're going to enjoy this biscuit, but first we wanna tell you guys about our sponsor who remember, helps make Ear Biscuits a reality for you to enjoy. EF College Break. The travel experts at EF College Break create amazing travel experiences for people aged 18 to 28. Listen, the only boring and tedious part of travel is the planning. Uh, reserving flights and hotels, figuring out what to do, when to do it, how to get from place to place, all the necessary stuff for having a truly great trip. EF College Break does all that for you. When you let EF College Break plan your trip, you are free to just Take the trip, just enjoy the trip, man. Uh, and what are you gonna be enjoying? Well, they've created a bunch of unique travel experiences you can browse right on their website. Trips like touring London and Paris. Paris. Uh, cruising the islands of Thailand, embarking on a coastal Thailand. adventure in Australia. Oh, that was bad, Australia. Uh, what about traveling through the green landscapes of Ireland? What about it? Sounds good. Uh, I would do it if I could, but I'm, I'll, I'm, I'm too old and I got, I got, 
I got too many stuffs I've got to take care of. Too many stuffs, man. We got stuffs. Even if you sign it by yourself, uh, you'll be grouped together with other travelers. So do it. If you head over to our special URL, efcollegebreak.com slash Rhett and Link, we'll hook you up with an extra $100 off your next adventure. That's right. For $100 off, go to efcollegebreak.com slash Rhett and Link. And now, on to the biscuit. I've been looking forward to having this conversation. I know you kind of came in here last minute. We appreciate that. But I will say that I've been looking forward to having uh, the Tezande Ear Biscuit for uh, quite a while. Uh, there's a number of questions and we've got we've got quite a history to go through, not only um, with you as a person and as a performer, but also with us collectively. I think there's some good stuff we, yes, we wanna head on. Definitely. But you know, having not released videos this year yet on either of your YouTube channels, we were trying to you know do some research, do some catch up, and one of the first things we found was an article out there that said, multiple multiple articles. Oh yeah. wow! All right, uh, saying that you were spotted shopping for engagement rings with your girlfriend. Are you engaged? Oh my! <laughs> I'm I'm behind the times on this. I need to. Uh, apparently, I need to be reading. TMZ. I well, that was the only one of the articles. F- find the latest uh, on Tazan Day. Well, the second article <laughs> said that you had had a secret wedding ceremony. Oh my goodness! Uh, I am just behind the times <laughs> now, on I... Tazan Day. I'm behind the fan fiction. <laughs> now, so, I'm, so I'm this... looking at your face and I'm trying to figure out: Are you legitimately surprised? And you you do legitimately look taken aback by this. Oh no, I'm not. Are I, you engaged? I, I actually am not. I am <laughs> not engaged. Uh, you know, I don't have time for relationships. You know, people are always asking. Hey, Hold on, I, you're not even in a relationship. Oh my goodness! I, seriously, I can't even find time to like tie my shoes. I seriously, and it's funny because people are always say, like, "Oh, Tay, you must get all the ladies. You must get all the whatever." Like, you, who are you after? And it's like, yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, but the thing they'd is, be surprised how dull my life but actually there's is. There's articles. The inter- no, and it, and it's the interesting thing is, is there's I haven't this, seen these articles. There's Man, this Google one news. source. This one source. Uh, it's difficult to ascertain the uh, reliability of this source, or given our conversation already, but also given the nature of this website. When we were just trying to catch up on you, <laughs> one of the things that it, it, it had multiple articles, including um, an engage the engagement, the secret looking for engagement rings, very large diamonds I mean, I at like a store. This version of Tay's and on day. I, I want to be a secret this. ceremony with I, a quote from a close friend. I'm not wow. kidding. It was just like this is. I, I, is this, where's this? You I don't mean, know about this I, thing, I, huh? Apparently, I haven't been Googling myself lately. Okay, well, I'm going to look it up right now. <laughs> so you haven't, you, you're not engaged, you don't have a girlfriend. Have you been, like, just perusing the diamond section just for I I, I I actually have not, but. See, every time I, you say that, I think you're about to say, I actually have. You're like, <laughs> I actually am engaged, but you're like, I actually am not. You well, keep hooking me. Well, no, I mean, it, honestly, it it's the most boring topic I could possibly think of like I think the media and the world kind of fascinates about these aspects of your personal life when you two go through this. I mean, is is you know you're 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 kind of big time now. You're kind of you know semi famous. You have the the speculation and the fanfic. I'm sure you've seen yourself in you know different cartoon configurations and whatever else people do. Yes, do, uh, do out there. I've heard uh, about it uh, about you. We have uh, him. You know. we, we have team members who tell us <laughs> team, not team to read who, the fanfic. Hold on, dude. Team members who well, allege I, I mean, the written link fanfic. Guys. So I, I am thoroughly enjoying this Tay's on Day fan. Hold on. I, I, it's much more interesting no, but than the I, real Tay's on Day. I have got to read the headlines of some of these articles. Because this is, this is this one source that is, uh, now, that I, now that I'm reading the, the titles of the articles, I'm realizing this is a, like a whole celebrity uh, news spoof site. And what, give us the date. This is like very recent. This is not like a year ago. This is like a two, few days ago. Today that we're recording. Is it April 3rd of the day we're recording this? April 2nd. So it's the day oh. after April Fools. All right. So if we, we did think what maybe this April Fool, but it's not. Tazon Day after. nude photos leaked online. Oh my goodness! Uh, Look on it. Tazon Day's dog recovering from surgery. That was March twenty eighth. <laughs> Tazon Day secretly married. That was today. Tazon Day named sexiest singer alive. That was oh, yesterday. Okay. Tazon Day Times Person of the Year twenty fifteen. And this wow. is all one website. What's the name of the website? Uh, MediaMass dot net. Oh. Tazon Day to be a dad. Uh, <laughs> Tazon Day goes uh, Gangnam Style. Tayson like, Day hey, single I'm again. Daddy. I'll do that. No. Tayson Day is the highest paid singer in the world. That was All yesterday. Right. <laughs> and Tayson Day new album in 2015 world tour. This 
you don't you're not in charge of this website, are you? I, I apparently not, though. I mean, it some of them I'll take. You know, hey, is this your version you of a publicist? They, you know what they say about all publicity? It's suspicious. <laughs> no, that is. Good I'm just so intrigued but, at this point. Just what by, does it say about Rhett and Link? That, I, I, nothing. It says. Oh, it says nothing about. Come on. It meaning the internet? Oh, or no, it meaning like, this website? It, well, it's a satire site, guys. Oh, yeah. Which that makes a whole lot of sense now. Oh. But they're fixated on satirizing you. Oh, it's a know your meme. Media Mass <laughs> is a parody news site best known for debunking celebrity rumors. Um, th- this is like us just. Li- live yeah, like, on the air discovering like the paid, onion. I feel like this is a paid promotion for Media Mass. Are they <laughs> it it seems like it. I, are they handing money under the table? Here? Let's see what it says about us. <laughs> Let's see what it says about us, guys. And I'm going to be disappointed if it doesn't say anything about us. But there's a Tezan Day article for every single day. Is it automatically generated? It says absolutely like nothing. nothing about us. Oh, and you my have like, goodness. You have like 50 articles on oh, this thing. Oh, man. Well, you know, I guess we fell for it. I am uh, winning that procedurally generated algorithmic uh, satire article game. Can you expound upon uh, this recent tweet in your Twitter feed? Uh, Now, this was posted on April Fool's Day. It was. I'm tired of lying. I'm attracted to aliens. I want to cuddle an alien, Hmm. feel tentacles all over my body, Mm -hmm. and make interspecies children. Now, you see, I think that April Fool's is like Vegas in terms of, what happens on April Fool's stays on April Fool's. Oh, and so it is it. April 2nd. I think saying that it's April 2nd is kind of like pleading the fifth. So I am just going to separate myself from all actions, all digital uh, trails that were left by me on April 1st. But, uh, but can I make an observation? You can make an observation. It's, it's, uh, okay, so you've just confirmed that this was an April Fool's Day pr- uh, prank tweet from you. But I think it that's... That gives insight into your sense of humor because it's it's not it's such a bizarre tweet. It's you like, thought he was serious? No, I'm just saying if this is a joke, it's an interesting. I mean, joke. I believe these articles about him getting married. But yeah, you're I, the one who fell for that. I'm just saying that. Tay, if I read this, if I read this sincerely, well, that's it's weird. If I read it as an April Fool's prank tweet, it's still weird. Interesting. Now, why is that? Because it's not a I joke. I guess this is the review, the reverse interview. Uh, yeah, you said you're like, what, I th- what I am I supposed to be hila- fa- falling for? I thought for? it was hilarious. Okay, okay. I, I, I thought it was riveting. <laughs> I'm not I saying th- it's not hilarious. I, I thought people would look at it and be like, <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> you, but are you, pl- you were playing into like the way that people like to speculate about you. Like, I bet he wants Maybe, to make love I mean, to an alien. No, 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 but but I think you kind of hit, because the larger question here, and the larger co- uh, problem is like, I have problems with whenever I try to be deliberately funny. Ah. I cannot be deliberately funny. Ah. I can only be incidentally funny. Okay. And uh, <laughs> this is, that defines my career, where it's like, I can be just being me, just being every day and not trying to be funny, being quote unquote the straight man, as it's called an improv comedy. Uh, you know, just fascinating. Uh, and it's fine. It's right. funny. People laugh at it like, oh gosh, he moved away from the mic. I didn't intend but when that. When you to go funny. for the joke, when I go for the joke, people have the exact reaction that you're having, where it's like, Tay, uh, okay, maybe that was a little <laughs> bit funny, but you know, it's. It's also kind of creepy. Like <laughs> you hit the wrong note there, dude. I mean, I I know you were trying to be funny, but uh, <laughs> so that's fascinating. That, that is a legitimate so, so Tayzande joke. That, that yes, that was Tayzande's attempt at a joke. Got it. And you are having a very typical reaction to my <laughs> oh, deliberate my. attempts at humor. So many interesting like, things it, happening already. But isn't it, it is, you know, your self-analysis there, I think I'd like to unpack over the course we of this. We want to get into that. Entire we can get into that. Conversation. Uh, before going all the way back to your birth, because I do want to go all the oh, way back. Oh, all the way back. All let's right. go back to, let's go back to the first time that the three of us met. And we I don't. We met doing, no, in that hotel. Yes. That poolside room. The Roosevelt. The, the Roosevelt Hotel. Uh, to do a segment, was it what was the show? Online Nation. Yes. Yes. Is that, yes you, yeah. You had yeah. Your show on the WB. Exactly. Let me and I'll set the stage here oh, yeah, because so you, yeah, we by all means. Uh, we. But I'm glad you remember. That's amazing. Yeah, I think we may have touched base about this at one time over the years because this has been eight years ago that wow. this happened. Just to put, holy put, moly, uh, some perspective here. But we were hosting the show Online Nation on the CW, which uh, some of the listeners may know was a really horrible show that we. 
hosted uh, four episodes it was, a, it was a clip show we tossed to internet videos. And your your video had gone viral in the either the spring or summer of 2007, and then our show was coming out in the fall of 2007, and there was this whole debate about, is it too late, does it make us seem out of touch to talk about Chocolate Rain, the first episode of this, in one of the first episodes of the season, and we were like, I feel like we've got to talk about this because it was such a big thing, and they were like, well, you guys, you know what you can do? You can go and interview the guy behind this thing because he's gonna be in LA for Jimmy Kimmel. Right, so this was at the at the height of Chocolate Rain. Oh, absolutely, and, I remember. But, but Online Nature wouldn't, the first, First episode would not air for like another month until like October. So that that yeah. was the that was the question of of the timing, but you know we wanted to not just be host, but we wanted to go out on location. We wanted to we wanted to create content, and part of that, if that was an interview, then hey, we were fine with that. Um, you know, I, it was our first it was our first time working in L.A. We had visited, mm -hmm. and you know we were intimidated by everything, and then now we're we're being told, okay, we've got like 20 minutes with you know what what we all call the chocolate rain guy you know uh we didn't know you as tay even though we knew that was your name and we were going to interview you and yeah i guess kimmel had put you up at the at the roosevelt at, at a room at, at yes. the roosevelt and it's funny you recounting that experience of la because that was actually my first experience in uh -huh. la uh as an adult at least since i was you know a, a kid i'd been there a couple times but uh and I just remember that sense of awe of being amazed. Like, you know, you feel the sunlight on Hollywood and Highland and it kind of, it's this weird filtered by pollution sunlight yeah. that you don't get in, in the South or the Midwest. And it's like- Or Minnesota where or, you were. Or Minnesota where I was at the time. And so it, just that sense of LA being so new right. and feeling different. And I was totally green at the time of that interview. Like that was just like me being caught up in the whirlwind of the craziness of- not knowing what to do, and, and we we can illustrate that because we uh, go to yeah we go to your door, uh, we knock on your door with our producer and your manager who was also your a relative of yours or somebody at the time. I think you were traveling with like a uh, was it a brother or a cousin? I don't or, think my brother was there, but somebody was, who was handling you at the time all right. comes to the door and says, "Well, what we open the door." And we can see through the door, which is on the hallway side. I can we can look through your room and see the pool where we wanted to set up the interview. Yes. And so we said, "Hi, we're here." I remember it being a weird, awkward situation. Somehow, is this what we're getting to? Yeah. Yes. And, and we were like, I, I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was. It felt very awkward. Your guard, your guard was up. And but, we were like, "Can we? Yeah, we want to. You mind if we do the interview poolside?" And you were like, "Sure." And then we were like, <laughs> "Okay." Invitation to me. Can we just? Can we just walk through your room, to get to the pool? It's right there. And you were like, um, no, I prefer that you walk around. <laughs> <laughs> well, what is he hiding in there? I was in boundary mode. We could have been anybody at that point. Well, I just, we were like, anybody. I wasn't expecting a film crew. Like, I, I think I was just kind of freaked out. I mean, I have- Because so we, yeah, we had a guy with a camera, and he was going to walk through your room. Yeah, and I, I have so many stories of just kind of being a little bit freaked out by the entertainment industry. And now it's just like if a film crew is, crew is coming, I'm just like, hey, you know, sure, come in, do whatever. I know what they do. I think at that time, I was just- uh, Literally, I went from being a nerd, and we'll get to this if we're starting from my birth, but I guess the fourth Let's go I mean, in there, yeah. I, I was literally a nerd in my living room making music as a hobby, singing in front of bed sheets, and Chocolate Rain sat around for two or three months without going viral. Uh, right. It was posted on the front page of Dig, which is kind of like Reddit back in that day. The views doubled in a week. Someone saw it on Dig, posted it on 4chan, kind of became a joke there, and uh, they prank called the Tom Green show, and it just kind of started to take off and go viral. But but the point, getting back to that moment in the hotel, yeah. is that I was so swept up by like literally in a period of a couple weeks, uh, thirty or forty radio interviews uh, uh, were completed by me in a very uh, yeah. very. It was a whirlwind. Whirlwind, you know, uh, you know, agents of all types, uh, booking agents, and. Uh, um, publishing agents and everyone and their mother, people wanting me to sing at their bar mitzvahs, sing at their corporate parties, sing. Everyone was trying to contact me about this video and I was literally still just a nerd in my living room inside. And this is the thing uh, that 
I I want to get into as we talk about like you know w- that video kind of catapulting you to fame is that sense that y- at that time was probably the beginning of you figuring out exactly what people were seeing in it and then and, and being like okay I'm beginning to interpret understand what they're interpreting me as and how I'm playing into that. Absolutely. So I think the best way to come back to that and and talk about you know chocolate rain and then the last eight years is to go back to the beginning and, All right. who, and, and who you are, where you're from, your All people. Right. So you start out, you're not, you're not Tay the moniker yet, you are Adam. I am born Adam Bonner, uh, sometime in 1982, <laughs> uh, while living in Chicago. Okay. Uh, I am the youngest of uh, three by quite a bit. My brother's six years older, my sister's 11 years older. Mm-hmm. I would say being around older people all of the time tremendously shaped my personality. I always felt very driven to be and act older than I was at every age. And I think it also contributed to my being very much an observer. I observe the behavior in other people and uh, you know, I, I observe and I mimic. And I think that, that tends to be uh, uh, a dominant aspect of my personality even today. Okay. Um, what was what was the parental situation? Both parents in the house. What? Both parents in the house. Very very lucky uh, to have two parents, and they are still wonderfully married uh, to this day. And oh, cool. uh, a lot of kids don't get that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, what did, what did they do or do now? Uh, they were teachers. My dad taught high school, um, and uh, my mom uh, taught elementary school, and then she was a principal for twenty years. And uh, you know, I think the. The benefit of that uh, as a parent is you get to see how other people's kids turn out. <laughs> ah. uh, and uh, you kind of, uh, I don't know if that shapes, I mean, I don't know. First of all, I, I have to say, because we kind of started with the relationship silliness. You know, right. first of all, being in a relationship and sustaining a relationship is one of the hardest things you can do. And so I, I am absolutely uh, amazed that my parents or anyone else who's been, been married a long period of time, I mean, that is hard hmm. to be with one person for 20, 30, 40 years. But then to have kids and raise kids, and again, that is one of the most difficult things you can ever do. Yeah. And I had no appreciation of this as a kid. So I think these are insights that I, I kind of get being an adult, being 32, almost 33 now, reflecting back on my childhood i think i see it with much rosier glasses and much more forgiving glasses because i'm kind of in the world and i'm like wow that must have been really really hard yeah um does your explanation of being kind of the young kid chameleon looking up to the older people kind of growing up early i another way people put that is He's got an old soul. Absolutely, I had a tremendously old soul, and and uh, you know everyone told me that when I was like ten years old. So I, it, it's not, it wasn't just something you you reapplied in retrospect because people ask about. Well, you got the deep voice, and well, surely you're affecting your voice and things of this nature. Where it's it, pe- people start to question and try to deconstruct you that you derive the reasons for that, or is it something that even back then your parents were like, yeah, you were. He, he was always an old soul. I, I was always very much an old soul. Um, you know, I remember one of my favorite role models when I was nine, ten years old was uh, Lieutenant Commander Data on Star Trek The Next Generation. <laughs> and I loved the idea, of, and, and also Spock on the, on the original Star Trek, I loved the idea of being reserved and uh, super intellectual and somehow greater than my own humanity. Now, uh I read somewhere, hopefully not on Rhett's website, uh, yeah. that your parents discouraged you from listening to popular music. Uh, so what what was behind that? I would say that my parents, and, and you know- Because you, pia- you, you got piano lessons and like voice lessons early on. Like music was a big part of your childhood. Well, I went, not, not voice lessons, but I did I did take some piano lessons. I was never particularly good at them, but I, I took a few years of piano. Um, I would say that, you know, my parents were, were fairly strict. I mean, I, I you know, being school teachers and I think seeing other people's kids and whatever, I don't, I don't know what their motivations were, but, you know, I, I'd say they definitely had a vision of prim and proper Mary Poppins kids, that that was kind of, uh, you know, the, their sense of a well-put-together family. And um, you know, was there any religious m- motivation behind that? I, I don't, 
think it was religious conservatism. Because we were certainly, I was raised Methodist Christian. We, we went to, to church, certainly. But I think it was almost kind of like, like when I was a kid, I, I wasn't allowed to play with uh, violent action figures. Couldn't We couldn't have uh, weapons. We couldn't. So I think. Like was, He-Man or something? Yeah. I Actually, I remember He-Man and She-Ra. <laughs> Uh, from when I was like three, four years old, I remember I I, I wasn't allowed to play with action figures. Oh, that, that had weapons, um, hmm. uh, or GI Joes, uh, or that type of thing. I don't know. I mean, I think it 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 was something that they meant well. You know, they're like, okay, don't don't have your kid don't have your kid play with GI Joes so they don't become violent or whatever. I mean, yeah. I I think there are so many things you do when you parent that it's like you just kind of make the best call that you are able to make. At that point in your life. And, you know, I, certainly there have been times in my past where maybe I would be a little bit angry about some of the more hurtful restrictions or whatever. Because uh, you're right. I mean, I, I didn't feel free to listen to a lot of popular music growing up. I felt and, and part of that, again, was what I described earlier, this very internal pressure I had to always be older, always seem more proper, always seem more reserved, always seem mm-hmm. more... Um, adults than even the adults around me and so i think that also kind of fed into this sense of well you know don't listen to you know oh, oh who's popular then you know nirvana corn rage against the machine etc um so you were raised in a pop music vacuum i think that's that's fair to say and well, i mean so in, what what, would, fact, what would you pull from for a chocolate rain then well and in fact what's interesting is i was raised in a pop music vacuum but then the internet came along when I was 12 or 13 years old, mm-hmm. uh, and around 13, 14, I started being able to download MP3s. And the internet was this wonderful place where it's like I realized I could do anything, and my parents couldn't see what I was doing. Mm-hmm. And so it kind of became this second life, so to speak, which is why sometimes I think I relate so much to, to kids in the digital generation now, because, I mean, it's, it's, it's all like crazy with social media and, like, you know, kids going to sleep with their phones and whatever. So um, what did you download? Uh, <laughs> you uh, say that almost uh, uh, suggestively. Um, <laughs> the, uh, innocent bunnies and uh, you know unicorns, but um, music no, though. What music? No, uh, I remember the first MP3 I ever downloaded was Will Smith's "Men in Black." <laughs> yes, okay, <laughs> here yes. comes it, the Men in Black. The Galaxy yeah. Defenders, the good guys who in black. Remember that in case you have face face make contact. I mean, um, surely your parents wouldn't have been upset <laughs> with that, right? I don't know. Well, you know, you got to be violent to defend the galaxy. I don't actually know. I I realize that you know I I have a lot of perceptions. Uh, I think, especially when I was young, uh, I think I would perceive people very literally when I was young, um, and so. You know, someone would say something to me once, uh, including my parents, like, OK, uh, you're not allowed to do this. And like, I would remember that four, five, six, seven years later. I've always had hmm. kind of a, that pictographic type of memory where it's like if you say something and I, I think I was brutal like this as a kid, uh, you know, where I'd be 17, 18 years old, remember something that my mom just said to me uh, offhand when I was 12. And I'd be like, oh, wait, you actually did say that. And overcompliant, like absolutely like over proper. That is, that is the best word. Overcompliant. Um, a, I was an overcompliant hmm. pleaser who very much took uh, what was said to me literally. I remember, uh, you know, one time I was uh, just watching TV, just watching Full House, which is a fairly innocent show when I was twelve years old, and 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 my mom was just, I mean, just saying, you know, uh, I don't like, you know, the the dialogue between you know the the, the father and you know the, the daughter, and that it was a little bit, you know. Uh, not what she thought was appropriate. There probably were Full House episodes like that. Um, they but, seemed like friends, not like a parent. Or just, I mean, it was just some scene or something where like something was said. It was something where it's like, I think my mom would have said it. Well, she was being and, sassy. And yeah, and forgot. And she probably forgot about it the next day. But I remember like years later, I was like 16, 17, almost 18 years old, you know, creeping up on adulthood and still having internalized uh, exactly what my mom said on that day as though it was gospel. Hmm. And I think it took me uh, a while to, to watch o- Full House. Well, to, to watch Full <laughs> I, I guess it's probably on Netflix now. But <laughs> I mean, have um, you watched it ever since then? I actually haven't. I actually stopped watching well, it at that should, point. And I, and I watched we should it. We should stop have right a marathon. Uh, full I, House marathon I, no, tonight. I, that actually took the Full House out of me. I think but, that constitutes torture in this day and age. <laughs> 
Oh, it's great. Still great. Still holds but, up. Holds up. The two spoiler alert. Uh, the youngest girl is really twins. And I know. Well, I know. Yeah, the other I know one that. in. I, I kind of figured that out eventually. But <laughs> you know, I mean, I. Uh, I guess we're kind of hitting on different points in my childhood. No, I would say, you know, the the extent to which I was extremely cerebral and extremely, um, you know, extremely pleaser, uh, it kind of resulted in a period of my life from about twelve to nineteen where I was just I had such high anxiety huh. that I I literally did not speak in my house. I retreated to the internet. I hmm. you know kind of you know I played games on the internet, played a lot of. Uh, Star Siege, it was kind of like Mech Warrior. Played a okay. lot of, you know, it did things with my online squad there. But wrote, when you walked in the front articles, door, I, I did not speak. I literally, I, I. Were your uh, parents worried? Did they? Was there an intervention of any kind? Oh yeah, I mean, I certainly saw plenty of therapists, and you know, there there was kind of that, you know, the the efforts to kind of tentatively break the ice. But I don't think they actually understood the rationale for. Well, how would they characterize it, though? Because that, that's one of the things I wanted to touch on, too, is since uh, a lot of your your career has been characterized by the way people interpret you. Absolutely. So how was that happening at that point? Like, did you begin to pick up on how you were being interpreted by friends, how you were being interpreted by your family, your parents? Um, and how, how would you characterize that? How I was being interpreted. I mean, I... I would say that if I go back to my 12, 13, 14-year-old brain, I definitely felt very, very parented and very, very um, watched, very, very- Sheltered. Li- sheltered and living in a panopticon where I felt like every breath, every you know step I took was kind of thought of deeply and monitored. And um, Even though it, you seem to now describe it as more of- a product of your own brain more than your the way you, the way your parents. I it was a absolutely. it was kind of a an unfortunate interaction between your parents being protective, but the way your brain worked. Absolutely, and I can say that because my brother and sister did not have that reaction, and they, it was the same set of parents. Okay. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, I uh, it's funny people ask uh a lot. It's odd, it's an oddly common question. What was it like when your voice got deeper? What was it like when uh, your, your voice cracked. You did your did your parents freak out? Did that? And you know the truth of that story is, uh, yeah, I was selectively mute and agoraphobic for about seven years of my life as an adolescent, and really did not uh, hmm. communicate like that in that way. And it wasn't really until I moved out, uh, and uh, uh, with my parents' support, their amazing parents graciously supporting me uh, as I moved out and went to college and kind of had my own adult life, that then I kind of started to get a perspective. And you know, well, how did you? I mean, how does that? How does that happen? How do you go from struggling in this way and even characterizing it as agoraphobic? Absolutely. To I then was. going to college because usually when someone is struggling to that level, they go to maybe a community college. They mm-hmm. live at home. How, indeed, how did that, that happen? Indeed, that is exactly what I did at first. I I went to community college. I lived at home. Uh, eventually, we all kind of moved to the Midwest out to Seattle. Uh, Lived in an apartment there, and I went to community college. Transferred down. How did you tell him where do you want to go? Did you email him, or uh, you spoke occasionally? You know, my sister was actually very helpful at that point. In kind of like when I started to be like eight, eighteen, nineteen, uh, you know, she was she was kind of the intervention and kind of because I mean she was moving on with her life and whatever. She was much older. She was kind of like, you know what you know. Clearly, there's some miscommunication that's happened between you and 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 mom and dad, and maybe it's it's time you kind of an, an adult now. Uh, let's evaluate this. And you know, I I uh, you know I am blessed to have such wonderful people in my family who've been supportive, both my parents and and my older siblings, uh, who've really been there for me in those moments where I kind of needed that type of you know tap on the shoulder. You're like, hey, uh, can we move on from this? And I think I eventually did. Hmm. And, uh, so mechanically, how did that happen? Well, it it happened. What was so interesting is uh, I lived in Capitol Hill in Seattle when I was nineteen. Uh, this was right when nine eleven happened, uh, mm-hmm. and you know Capitol Hill is a very very politically active, you know, very kind of you know um, eclectic artistic uh, type community. And uh, I'd say that's the period of my life where I kind of started to uh, I really warmed up. To uh, I went to community college there. I was in different independent media movements. Uh, I think that kind of 
post 9-11 lead up to the Iraq war period was when I kind of started to look at the internet as something where, okay, is this something where we can attempt social change or at least kind of create a dialogue? And of course, you know, it, it really wasn't successful and you didn't have social media. You didn't really have the critical mass to do that with it. Hmm. Um, but I remember because eventually I ended up studying social change and the relationship between performance and social change when I pursued a PhD at the University of Minnesota. And I think it was kind of that moment living in Capitol Hill where there were all sorts of different types of, uh, you know, politics and marches and, and things going on uh, that I kind of both came out of my shell that I grew up in mm -hmm. and became acclimated to different types of people. And was that because those those movements uh, usually involve actually getting to know and interact with people is that what kind of drew you out like oh i i'm i'm into this movement or i want to go be a part of this group like how do you begin to have those interactions with people where you start feeling like okay no i can be social i can speak like do you remember a moment um i don't know if i remember a moment i mean so much of my agoraphobia and not uh feeling safe outside was a fear that my parents would like when i was like 17 16 a, a, 18 feet, a fear that my parents would drive by and see me being normal or see me doing something that they would not approve of. Hmm. And I literally clamped up and, and shut down to the, for that reason. I like, I didn't go outside. I was afraid like uh, that, that I would be outed, so to speak, by, by being seen by that panopticon. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think at some point, you know, I, I was, you know, my, my parents were so good to me when I was, you know, I mean, they, they, uh, a lot of kids, you know, when they're not 18, 19, they're, they're out of the house, they have to support themselves. You know, my parents were very generous. I mean, they 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 paid for me to be in an apartment. I was there by myself. They paid for me to be independent. They kind of knew what I needed in order to transition into adulthood, and they gave it to me. Um, and I was just, I was very lucky because uh, not every person who came from where I came from has that level of support and that level of, of just doggedness. And saying, hey, this is how we're going to do this. And this is and, you know, it was effective. I, uh, uh, and I remember, you know, I, it, it was just uh, I kind of discovered who I was uh, or started to discover who I was in that period of time when I was 19, 20 years old. And what was that discovery? Um, uh, I think it's still ongoing. It's, it's still ongoing, sure. uh, you know, 12, 13 years later. But uh, just being able, I mean, sometimes I, I remember I uh, 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 was just walking around Capitol Hill one day and Capitol Hill was in, in that at that period of time was a neighborhood where you could literally just be walking around. And you, you see a march, you see like protesters and plays and just like, you know, marching up mm -hmm. in an organized march. And uh, I remember uh, one time uh, I was just walking outside uh, Seattle Central Community College where I was going to school. And uh, they were having uh, what they self called. This is their title, uh, you know. They, they, they call it the Dyke March, which you know, celebrating, um, you know, uh, that community and whatnot. And I had no idea what being transgendered or lesbian or anything was or a Dyke March. But I was just like, oh wait, it's a march, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you were in. Let me let me do it. And so literally, I I was uh, <laughs> I was in. I was marching, and you know, <laughs> at that period of time, you know, they they were very they're anti administration. And I have this memory of like you know. Uh, shouting crazily, being 19 years old on the march uh, uh, through the streets of Capitol Hill in Seattle, just screaming, uh, pussy power, yes, Bush power, no, pussy power, yes. And that, that's literally what the channel of the march was like. I didn't know who I was. I was a 19-year-old kid. I'm like, okay, fine. It's a dyke march. I'll join the dyke march. I'll join. I'll <laughs> a little bit of that compliance thing still kicking in, but... Uh, a, a little bit. <laughs> at least you were you were out in the open. I was out in the open. I, I think I had kind of started to feel a little bit more free or at least not constantly monitored for the first time <laughs> yeah, yeah. and uh what's weird and we'll get to this later is how tays on day blowing up and coming into um you know i mean i hate to say it but it is kind of worldwide fame i walk down the street in london and people will be like are yeah. you that guy <laughs> right i can't escape it kind of brought that panopticon back Oh, wow. That yep. I had grown up with and all of the psychology and all of the reluctance and all of the issues that are kind of involved in that sense of always being monitored. It's hmm. it's back again. And right. well, I mean, we can talk about connect that. the dots of how we got there and then we'll explore that. <laughs> um, so you're marching in the Dyke March. That's their <laughs> name, not ours. Um, and 
then you go home and you write Chocolate Rain about that experience. Okay. <laughs> or okay. that's no, what no, no, Chocolate no, 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 Rain no. is this about. Is, th- there's an eight-year gap here okay. that right. we actually need to uh, yes. cover. Um, yeah, do it. Uh, well, I, I kind of already covered it. Like, I, I uh, was in Se- uh, Capitol Hill in Seattle for a year and a half, uh, moved down to finish my undergrad to Olympia, Washington, uh, the capital city of Washington, beautiful, evergreen state college, very evergreen if you ever go there, uh, one of the most beautiful uh, landscapes anywhere, um, especially when it's sunny. It's, it is sometimes overcast there, but yeah. uh, beautiful place uh, in the Pacific Northwest. And uh, uh, while I was there uh, at Evergreen, I had an advisor uh, who said that he had gotten his PhD in American studies at Bowling Greens. Uh, and he suggested that I apply to American studies programs because I, I just kind of had this assumption uh, when I finished my undergrad that, hey, I've been in school 16 years. Why don't I stay in school another seven and get a PhD? I think it was kind of that part of the, the boy in me who was like Lieutenant Commander Data who, who just wanted to be smarter to be smarter. Mm-hmm. Um, and so basically I pursued a PhD for all of the wrong reasons. <laughs> Not because I was super, super passionate about a, a project that needed the solution of being researched, but because I just wanted a gosh darn PhD. Yeah. So you got and, a Bowling Green. Um, no, uh, I did listen to the advisor who went, uh, uh, who got his PhD in American studies at Bowling Green, however, and I applied to American studies programs because they allow you in some cases to be more self-directed to kind of you study history, but also mix in humanities and put other people on your committee who, uh, kind of tailor your research interest to you. And the way he described it to me is like, you know, you know, Adam, you know, I, I, I went to my, my American studies PhD. I don't even know what I wanted to do until the, the second or third year. I'm like, oh, that's great. I have no idea what I want to do. I just want to get a PhD. Why don't I apply for that? And so, uh, I applied like six, seven places, Emory, uh, uh, communication, the University of Washington, et cetera. Uh, University of Minnesota accepted me with a full four, four years of funding. Uh, and I got a fellowship the first year, which meant I didn't have to be a teaching assistant, which was cool. Hmm. Uh, so I moved to Minneapolis. Uh, and uh, to be honest, I thought that in that period of life, I would still be passionate about social movements and social change. But I kind of found that when I moved away from Capitol Hill in Seattle, and also, you know, this is 2004 now, so we're kind of moving away from that historical moment of post 9-11 and the lead up to, you know, everything that followed. Um, I, I never really found my footing in any similar type of community like that in Minneapolis. And so I didn't really have a research interest, so to speak. Mm-hmm. I, you know, pursuing the Ph.D., uh, I would take the coursework, learn how to do ethnographic, you know, anthropological research, learn how to do historical research. But I was surrounded by people who had passionate life projects hmm. that, that they were, you know, uh, say, you know, they, they'd grown up American Indian and they were just dis- uh, researching uh, American Indian land rights. Or it was part of or, uh, you know, they uh, grew up identifying as queer and, you know, they, they're studying, you know, sexuality and, and, and feminism and all sorts of things. Me, and you didn't have something like I that. I didn't have anything like that. And so... So did you feel... It seems like what, what you're saying is that you felt different. I absolutely felt different. And, you know, one of the ways I responded to that difference is I continued my lifelong music hobby. I'd never been a serious musician, but I've always been a hobbyist musician, kind of uh, doing it for fun. Uh, and I would start uh, going to open mics in Minneapolis around 2006 dragging sometimes my you know 40 pound stage piano with a 30 pound amp uh i remember one cafe i went to uh which is in a different part of the city it was the middle of winter in minneapolis i literally had alligator cables tying a 30 pound amp to a 40 pound stage piano on one of those little airport uh you know uh hand cart things yeah and i was dragging in through the snow i i on the sidewalk on the sidewalk uh (laughs) drug it in through the snow left this little lake of water in this cafe that had maybe 10 people in it. And so it takes me 10 minutes to set up. Why didn't to... you just get a keyboard? I <laughs> know uh, I had a keyboard. I'm dragging the, the stage piano and oh, st- uh, stage piano is a keyboard. Yeah. Stage it's piano still is a big. Keyboard. It's still big. But uh, I basically remember I'm play- I'm taking forever to set up. I'm playing two songs there <laughs> singing for 10 people, five of whom are not paying attention. Uh, the other five of whom really don't care. And then, you know, putting it back together and going back, you know, in, into the shame of my car and going, going back home. 
And then YouTube comes along. At this point, before YouTube, the people who knew you, your friends, mm-hmm. uh, did they, what was their interaction with you? What was their assessment of you? Did they consider you different? Or, you know, uh, Adam is, you know, he's a weird guy. I, I love him for hey. it. Was it that kind of thing? I imagine that people have found me to be unique, unique. my entire life. But you never... I have, I have never felt like I could have just that every day blending in. And I think that's one reason I withdrew as a kid, because I wanted that so, so huh. badly, especially as an isolated teen. Um, right. And perhaps even uh, growing up into college, I think that as a teen, you know, I mean, gosh, I so wanted to be just, you know, a scene kid who was, you know, like listening to, you know, Corn and, and, and No Fear and all the bands there and, and, you know, just kind of like hanging out and having my posse, having my. On the uh, inside. Crew. On the inside. This is who I, I just wanted to blend in. I so badly hmm. wanted to blend in. And, uh, you know, it just never was. It. it it wasn't in the cards, uh, you know. It was, it, you know, partly for reason my parents, partly for reason who I was. I've just always stuck out. But you're, I mean, if you're saying if we were to travel back in time and meet you on the street and ask you what is your life goal, you would have said blend in. Yet you're dragging a huge keyboard down <laughs> in the snow. So almost in spite, like going on instinct. This is the core counter- conflict of my existence. <laughs> you are you are highlighting the core inner conflict of days on day. The double identity that has never resolved itself. <laughs> so YouTube uh, comes along. So YouTube comes along. I get sick of dragging my keyboard or just playing at open mics where nobody's listening. And I'm like, okay, wait, YouTube is there. I could just make videos in my living room. And uh, maybe reach a larger audience than the five or ten people listening to me at open mics. So is the first and video on your channel now the first one you upload? No, <laughs> no, 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 no. Okay. The the videos on my channel have been very mercilessly pruned. Because um, <laughs> Canon and Z original classical arrangement, yeah, eight years ago mm-hmm. is is. And then you have Love, an original song by Kubi featuring Tay Zande, and Absolutely. then the third one that's still. Public is chocolate rain. Yes, heard of that. One hundred and one point five million views. The first video I ever. Uh, first of all, the, the way I started on YouTube, uh, January two thousand seven, uh, because you know I was still known as Adam Bonner at this point, and I said I need to come up with an alter ego. Mm-hmm. Um, I want it to be something that's not in use by anybody else, uh, and so I kind of googled different uh, variations. Why? Why? Why need an alter ego? Because at yeah, that I mean, point, you're not a rapper. No, at that point, I believed my career would be to be a university professor where I would be publishing papers and I wanted that to have its own Google life. I Uh wanted uh, my career as an academic, uh, as a researcher to have its own Hmm. life separate from my music career. And so I- So few people calculate the beginning (laughs) of a YouTube channel Especially in 2007. Oh, to that degree. Oh, and, and even more so, I wanted a name that if people heard it, they would know how it was spelled if it was said in conversation so that if they heard Tezande, they would know, oh, Tezande.com, that I didn't want it to have an ambiguous spelling. Uh, and so I think I was just entering different options on Google, like, like Ray Monday, da 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 and I entered Tezande in quotes on Google, and it got zero results. Really? And I'm like, <laughs> boom, I'm going to take YouTube.com slash Tay Zonday. Just off the top of your head. MySpace.com slash Tay Zonday. It doesn't mean, Zonday and Tay don't mean anything in another Zonday. language or? No, that, no, they were, they uh, Was were it just, inspired by something or? It was created top, as an alter ego. Like uh, just, t- the words were just like top of mind. Like I'm just saying. Tay Zonday. Flay, Cron. I liked the way it Flambe. rolled. Flambe. I liked the way it rolled off well, the tip of the tongue. It, it does. <laughs> the funny thing is, is you just said you wanted it to be something that when people heard it in a conversation, they would know how to look it up, but the first time I heard it, you thought it was Tazon. I thought it was Tazon Day. Yeah, that's the that's the thing I wasn't thinking of. So it's kind of like uh, if I could go. But back. you knew how to spell it, and if it was Tazon Day, it probably would have been the you, same you thing, have, right? You would have still yeah, gotten there. Are there. No spaces. You went to YouTube.com says Tazon Day. You, you still, still, still would have gotten there. You still would have gotten there. But yeah, some people come. Hey, Tazon. I'm like, okay, whatever. Like, <laughs> and, and and that's almost kind of something I because you know I blew up so fast so quickly. That it kind of didn't make a difference, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it didn't matter. Tayson Day brings up Adam Bonner. Adam Bonner brings up Tayson Day now. Uh, but 
So you created the channel, and then what? Uh, the first video I uploaded on YouTube was my singing Swing Low Sweet Chariot Okay. in the range of Paul Robeson. And so it was down like, Swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home on the keyboard. <laughs> and uh, I the, love that. <laughs> the feedback I got on YouTube was uh, characteristically very honest. It kind of like, uh, my ears are bleeding. Uh, have you ever tried, like, maybe you want to try Australian throat singing? You sound <laughs> like a frog, Tay. This is weird. And maybe sometimes people... And these are friends, because when you start YouTube, (laughs) who's watching? Uh, Well, no, I mean, yeah, I mean, and occasionally other YouTubers. There there was some organic reach. Okay, okay. What you could do is you could add people as friends. Oh, Oh, yeah. yeah. Boy, we do that. And then after you added them as friends, you could invite them to subscribe. Yes, or just send and s- just mass yeah. send the video fact, out to all your friends. Funny story. Early 2007. Guess who was in my first 15 YouTube friends that I added? Um, let me let me guess. Yes. Well, now that you're looking at me, I'm thinking. Might us. it be Red Link? No. <laughs> oh dang it! Could please be us. No. no. Kid Raul, Justin Bieber. Oh, oh really? <laughs> yeah, he actually started. He had a. YouTube we were hoping channel. it was us. No, <laughs> no it was uh, back Justin when Bieber. Friends. Yeah, and he was just a YouTube channel yeah, at that right. point in life. You know, just uh, uh, before Justin Bieber, he was uh, that YouTube channel, and his mom was like, "Hey, you know, my kid is really great. And my twelve year old is really great at singing Michael Jackson and uh, playing drums. Uh, yeah, uh, and which he was a great singer. Um, but it's just kind of a, a funny tidbit of YouTube history. <laughs> Do you think he saw Swing Low? Back then, like you were seeing him and he was seeing you, I'd like to. I'd I'd like to think so. I'd have to ask him, Uh, but I probably did invite him to subscribe. (laughs) (laughs) But uh, in any case, uh, that's kind of when I realized that uh, that and a couple other experiments that the super low bass range probably was not going to be my ticket to popularity on YouTube, and I actually started singing things an octave higher in the baritone range. Which is where Chocolate Rain and some of the other songs that eventually reached popularity. Uh, Which to give, yeah, I mean, you you've already demonstrated it, but you know, people already kind of. I think the layman already thinks of Chocolate Rain and the rest of your music as being very bassy, is how they would describe it to begin with, even though it's technically a baritone. Yeah, you know, you approached YouTube with such a confidence of success. In such oh. a level of calculation, I would say, you know, when you say, "Well, I've, I've got to have an alter ego because I'm going to be a successful, right, a PhD, yeah. and then I'm I'm going to be successful on YouTube under a name that you need to be able to Google and find because that's part of the success." Mm-hmm. Um, I- and I'm even going to write an explanation for the actions, assuming people will be speculating about it. Yet the right. calculation didn't extend to the things that actually made it. Such a such an explosion, right? Wouldn't you agree? I I completely agree with that assessment. So it was it wasn't like nothing was calculated. An ex, a lot was calculated, and that's the first. That's one of the many things I'm finding fascinating here was the level of calculation that then set up everything that you could never have planned yeah. to yeah, be it, so brilliant. Absolutely, there was a tremendous amount of calculation involved in laying the ground for what then happened spontaneously. And so tell us it, how it happened. I mean, the eruption. How, what was the experience for you? Like, how did you even know it was happening? Because it was delayed. The video was out there for a while. It, you were getting feedback. People were probably saying the same thing about yeah. Chocolate Rain they said about love in the other yeah. videos, right? Yeah. And like I foreshadowed earlier, um, I don't know if it'll be edited out, uh, but uh, Chocolate Rain was uploaded in April of 2007. It, Got a little bit of traction, you know, maybe 12,000 views from, you know, the front page feature of the other video. But it largely sat around. It was maybe at 30,000 views by uh, June of 2007. Mm -hmm. And I think in early July, someone posted it on dig.com, the Mm -hmm. social bookmarking. So basically read it, but back then. Uh, And it was at the top of dig.com for maybe a week. And the views doubled to about 60,000 in that time. Someone saw it on dig.com posted it on 4chan and then they just thought it was hilarious and uh it kind of became a frank a a uh a meme there so to speak 
At now, this time, yeah, what were you yeah, doing? Yeah, did, so did you were you were following this. I'm assuming you saw the views going up. You I knew saw where it was the views being posted. I didn't know any of this until you know a, a, afterwards. I was basically what, what was I doing that summer? Um, was I a teaching assistant over the summer? I'm trying to remember summer of 2007. I think I may have been off that. The summer I can't I, I can't exactly remember, but I know I was li- uh, basically living the life of a PhD student and a a nerd in my living room who uh, just did music as a hobby. And so when so when it, so when it happened, like even the step one, which is you know dig, mm-hmm. going from thirty to sixty thousand views, um, you knew this was happening. You can see people's comments. What's going through your mind at that time? Is it People are oh, people. People get this. People okay. like my music, or is it? Whoa, the, where, they're where making it these really observations. Hit me that something was happening was when uh, there was a 4chan thread where they tried to prank call Tom Green and successfully prank called Tom Green in his web show that he did from his living room at the time. And then the caller just breaks out singing "Chocolate Rain," mm-hmm. and then I see Tom Green kind of reacting to yeah, "Chocolate Rain," da 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 da. And uh, the very next day, it's featured on Carson Daly. Uh, uh, his late night show, and then it just becomes a national news story. And uh, perhaps, you know, every way there is to message me on YouTube, I have a contact form on my website. Uh, people were trying to contact me to get in on this news story of this video that is going viral. And I remember in the first two weeks, I did perhaps 30 radio interviews, all of them terrible. Because I just had no sense of being a public figure on that level. Or but why? What I mean, just in the privacy of your own mind, what was your explanation My for explanation the explosion? My explanation was that this is what it's like to have 15 minutes of fame. This is what it's like to be a national news story. Because, and- but specifically, because you, now you've already articulated this, you you understand exactly why it blew up, yeah. but at the time, as it was blowing up, how did that realization come about, and what were you thinking in that first interview when somebody talked to you? Um, you know, unfortunately, this is still on YouTube. I think somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, no, what was my first interview? It was with, of all people, Opie and Anthony in New York okay, was the yeah. first mm-hmm. radio interview I ever did, and I followed a conversation about what percentage of the ocean is composed of whale semen. And you know when you're doing the phone interview, they have like the segment that you can hear it. You can hear hear what's going on. And it's like, well, you know, like up to 20% of the ocean might be composed of whale junk. Oh, and here's the guy next. You're not going to believe it, but he's blowing up on this YouTube thing. We've got the guy. It's Taze on the the chocolate or whatever. And uh, uh, I remember I was very self deprecating in the first interviews what it really what really stands out about most of the interviews i've done about chocolate rain is people try to peg me into turning it into a polemic interview they say well clearly this is making a political statement tay and uh, uh is there a deeper meaning is there a uh are you trying to say something like that and um i have always shied away from being that so so called you know Malcolm X figure or um, polemic political figure with chocolate rain as the basis, only because while obviously there is a political message or there is a social justice message to it, people who experience it, they come from all sorts of different experiences. Someone will say, "Hey, my two year old can't stop singing this at bedtime." Uh, hey, you know, uh, I I love the way you move away from the mic to breathe in. Or this is just this was so funny. We just passed this around the office at work, and um, I, I want to validate those experiences. And then maybe ten, twenty percent of people are actually listening to the lyrics and saying, "Okay, you know, there's a deeper critique. There's a deeper, a deeper social message here." Uh, Kanye was very nice. I think he shouted it out in a song, uh, uh, saying that I that the Tezande was deep. Um, and and is that was that your intention um, in the lyrics? Did you want to talk about that? I absolutely did, and uh, I think, especially when it comes to social justice, people are turned off by polemics. People don't want to be preached to, and so uh, I sing about what I can't say about. But summarize it for us. Well, I think I just did. I always say the question is more important than the answer in terms of if Chocolate Rain can get people asking the question, hey, what does Chocolate Rain mean, then 
we are in an interrogative space. But we have we have moved from having no conversation to at least there being a question. But I mean, I understand that uh, you know rock jock radio DJs are gonna ask that question because they want to know what the hell it means, so to speak. But what, didn't they really just want you to be weird so they could laugh at you? I mean, oh, oh absolutely, and. I mean, that was a really, um, it was a hard aspect of the way in which I blew up because, let's be honest, I blew up for the incidental comedy in some regards of Chocolate Rain, for the unintended comedy. And there would be people asking in the comments, can I laugh at this? Be not knowing whether or not I intended it seriously. And, I mean, my response to that has always been, hey, if... I do something and you want to laugh at it and it makes your day a little bit brighter, makes your life a little bit brighter. Go ahead. That's fine. But I think the problem when I did interviews and appearances and sometimes in that period of my life is that people would expect me to show up and do that deliberately. And as we've already covered, I get into trouble when I try to be funny deliberately. Yeah, you weren't trying. When I try to do deliberate comedy, it doesn't work. But, I just have to be me. But I'm really interested in the in the realization. You know, there, there's a more stark example of this. Uh, there's a guy, uh, there, there's a few documentaries about called Jesco White. I don't know if you've ever heard of this. This is this guy. He's called Jesco White, the mountain dancer, a guy in West Virginia who kind of rose to fame in the, in the 80s or the 90s. It's just a, he was a very very interesting personality and had like this alter ego that was Elvis Presley and stuff and he became he kind of rose to national uh -huh. fame was on Oprah mm -hmm. and it was in that moment of him taking that first trip so, so to speak to Hollywood where he started realizing that people were laughing at him and he ha and he basically just had an implosion. Mm -hmm. it, it, it sounds like he was very sincere in his mountain dancing. Yeah, it sounds like because you came up a different way through the internet, you you got to see people's interpretation of your work from the very beginning. So it wasn't a surprise that people found it funny. No, you know what was funny is I actually found the hate on the internet refreshing at first. And I say this because when you sing at open mics in Minneapolis, uh, I love Minnesota, I love Minnesotans, they're not really that confrontational. Like, you, you perform in New York, New Yorkers will tell you exactly what they think about you. Like, you say, hey, how did I do? They're like, hey, you know, it was okay, maybe not my thing, whatever, you know, whatever. In, in Minnesota, you never get that type of feedback yeah. performing live. They're always kind of like, uh, that, that was nice, I keep going with it. So I came to YouTube like starving for honest feedback about how, who I did and what I was. And so uh, you know, I, I certainly got it. I certainly, you know, people are unrestrained on the internet. I would say that post chocolate rain, because that's really the question that it segues into, is uh, what happened after chocolate rain blew up and uh, who did I want to be? Is that, right. uh, did I, I've always had this struggle of, okay, um, there's part of me who wants to be "Quote unquote," uh, a a serious actor, serious entertainer, serious whatever you want to say. And seriously, um, I love dramatic acting. I love being on sets. I love uh, you know playing uh, the more naturally. I would actually play the the role of authority. You know, the the governor, the senator, the uh, chief of police, etc. Uh, the things working against that are a. I look way too young. <laughs> no one would ever cast me for that right now. Uh, and uh, B, you know, it, it, I think there's also kind of like the, there's that historical aspect where it's like, um, you know, Chocolate Rain blew up because people are just entertained by it. And it's not a type of entertainment that I was able to reproduce calculate. deliberately to calculate. And I think, I mean, you, you started earlier in the conversation talking about, well, the dearth of what, where are my videos on YouTube, where I haven't been uploading on YouTube. Um, I have, by the way, been on Twitch a lot. I'm like on yeah, Twitch yep. five, six hours a night uh, at twitch.tv slash Tezonday Games. Uh, Tezonday Games. But uh, I think one of the struggles that I had with YouTube uh, over the past seven years is I could not reproduce the entertainment value of Chocolate Rain as deliberate comedy. It was incidental. It was just me being me and honestly being me as nobody in the sense of being nobody and just screwing around saying, hey, I'll put this up and uh, whatever happens will happen. And it's almost kind of like that classic Garden of Eden story where it's like before Eve bit the apple, she did not know she was naked. Hmm. And suddenly 
uh, you know, I blow up with Chocolate Rain and I'm on Jimmy Kimmel and I do the Dr. Pepper video and it's just this Energizer bunny that keeps going and going and going. I'm, I'm parodied on South Park in 2008 the next year. I won a YouTube award, won a Webby award, uh, do stuff with TurboTax and kind of incidentally become this odd icon who is tied to the internet because uh, even today, people who don't remember Chocolate Rain and don't remember the name Tazan Day, they'll stare at me from across say, the DMV, and say, you're that guy from the internet. <laughs> you did that video. From the internet, yeah. yeah from the internet. And you you did are the video. internet. I Yeah, I somehow kind of became... In people's minds. An, an iconography of the internet, and internet success, and, and blowing up on the internet, and, and what have you. But And I have to go back a little bit before we keep moving forward, and how do you build on or move forward from Chocolate Rain is just... You talk about the moment of real realization when Eve eats the apple. Absolutely. But for you, is that w- what is the realization? Is it, y- you seem to say it was what I did that made me so successful, I didn't do intentionally. But I want to ask was there also a realization that you bite the apple and then it's, hold on, people are laughing at me not with me because I wasn't intending to be funny. So here I am on Kimmel, who am I, just so you can laugh at me some more? I mean, was there a struggle there? How and do you play that? What's how, the con- how do you play that? And what's the, what's the, what's the, in- what's the conclusion oh, no, for this, yourself? This is the ongoing struggle of my career because you have entertainers who build successful careers being laughed at. Carrot Top, you know, People. Yeah, but he's a comedian. But, I mean, no, he's, no, but, he's cracking jokes. He's cracking jokes. My point is like that. My point is that is a distinct career path, and like I think that has always kind of been the crossroads of my career. Even when Chocolate Rain was blowing up, is like I have nothing against uh, hypothetically the career path or people who take the career path of being laughed at. And uh, but when know, it's you, there's a but, moment where you might be hurt by that, or you can either harness it, be hurt by it, or I would assume both. I think there was some of both. I think here's what I, you know, hindsight is always twenty twenty, And I'm not going to say that I have regrets, but I will say that, you know, you look at what, what Miranda Sings has done. Uh, she's very successful. She's kind of taken and, and you know, that, that's not her real name. Um, but she created the uh, Miranda Sings character as this over the top. Uh, character to be laughed at. And she's actually an extremely, extremely talented singer. Mm. But Miranda Sings is the obnoxious, you know, put lipstick on and do it and and do the whole, you know, get internet views show to... Brilliant. A, a, a brilliant business plan. In retrospect, bec- because I had this inner conflict that you're describing, I didn't embrace Tay Day like, say, a Miranda Sings and just take it and run with it and say, hey, yeah, you know, I'm the guy who moves away from the mic to breathe in and do this and this and this and this, you know, and I think it would have been a more successful business that blew up more if I had kind of been willing to stomach the reality that the way to grow it in that moment was to just accept being laughed at and create Tazan Day as this alter ego of being laughed at. And and even larger than life thing, I think what happened instead is that it kind of became this uh, odd thing that I, I I wanted to personally identify my Of course it did, because it, the and, difference between you and uh, Miranda is that Miranda was created by Colleen. I mean, we talked to her on the show, yeah. but it was you expressing yourself, and then you find that people reacting in this way, and of course it was a, it's a, a lot more complicated for you in that moment, in that volcanic explosion of viral video, to figure out... People are interpreting me. Yeah, it's a moniker. You made up a name, but you were just, it was you. Absolutely. It was not a deliberate character So at was, all. But, So was there a moment of biting the apple? Oh my gosh, they're laughing at me. Or I don't know if it was a moment of, uh, I, don't, I don't know if I can, can uh, take it on a particular moment. Um, I would say, what I knew from the experiences that I had uh, in the summer of 2007 and, and the fall thereafter, because uh, I had a lot of, you know, uh, 
pretty intense experiences. I mean, I was opening for Girl Talk at First Avenue, you know, the, the most famous called Minneapolis. Uh, you know, the, the Dr. Pepper video that got huge. It was, of course, you know, a kind of a very different uh, per, portrayal of me uh, in, in an exaggerated way. Um, and on Kimmel. I mean, and, that, and, and it's amazing. And, 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 and the front page of Sunday's All Times and da 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 it, You know, it's, I knew that I needed a lot more time to figure out who I was than the moment of being hot would allow. Because everyone was telling me when I was that in that moment, and I think even for a week or two, uh, correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, but I think if you look at the history of Google trending topics, Chocolate Rain Tuesday Sunday is like number one, number two for like a week or, or two in July of 2007. Um, everyone was telling me in that moment, it's like, okay, you're hot now. Whatever you're doing now, this moment may never come again in your life. So there is a tremendous pressure on me. Uh, just from, to go from being a nerd in my living room to suddenly, uh, and by the way, I was still in graduate school, school at this point. I decided right. not to drop out. Uh, I still thought I'd be finishing the PhD, so I tried to mix them both. Uh, you know, there was a tremendous pressure to try and make the most of this moment. And I think my response uh, in that aha moment was just to realize, hey, I'm not going to be able to be the person I need to be to take the best advantage of this moment of being hot. Uh, I'm just not going to be there. And that's okay. I'm just going to keep trying to be me and explore being me. And I probably have many more years of doing that to figure out who I am and who I want to become. And that's exactly what I did. I, I stayed in grad school. I continued uploading YouTube occasionally and kind of did the same thing. Uh, and and that to some extent, that's why I came to YouTube. I came to it as an experiment to get feedback on who I was and learn to be who I was. But um, well, it's almost like you found yourself in a place where it an impo- I would call this an impossible position to try to calculate a miscalculation to become in- I love that to become intentional about something that was unintentional. Now, the the fascinating thing is that you have you have made a career that was based upon that. You know the biting the the bite, not the biting the apple but the the raining of the chocolate, uh, and then the, the the eventually kind of re- realizing what that was that was happening, it, and how has that unfolded, and what does it mean for you as a as an entertainer now? Well, here is the silver lining of having a lot of people laugh at you, uh, and and what I kind of realized, and this is maybe how I made peace with it. Okay, <laughs> is that it? You know. If you have if if you just have exposure of any type, whatever type of exposure that is, assuming it's not negative exposure, uh, you know, people laughing at you is not necessarily negative exposure. Uh, some people will look at that and they'll take it seriously and they'll try to just because you got in front of their eyeballs, you will have an opportunity to develop a more serious relationship with them. And you will have an opportunity to then kind of get to be, hey, wait, okay, uh, yeah, I realize you're laughing now. Okay, that was funny. Then I, but when you get to know me, I'd say that knowing me in person is a pretty different experience than just, you know, watching Chocolate Rain and laughing mm-hmm. at it. And uh, that's kind of been uh, what, what drove my career uh, is, you know, I would post content on YouTube. There is always that YouTube audience that saw it for whatever reason. I've tried posting more serious things on YouTube, uh, there is a smaller audience for that. There's a smaller audience, for example, for my singing Somewhere Over the Rainbow from Wizard of Oz. Mm-hmm. I think I did a decent job with that. You know, uh, bring him fro- home from Les Mis. Uh, I've done more serious stuff on my YouTube channel. Uh, and I think I've, you know, done it some semi-competently. But it is true, the audience for that has never been as large. And it's a, it's a, the, and it's a diff- they're the coming for a different for, thing. For my, you know, like singing... Call me maybe in a deep voice, ba- bass voice and, tr- yeah. and being entertaining in that way. I mean, yeah. I mean, certainly I've questioned with just conversations with you over the years when you'd like brush shoulders at an event or something and be like, well, is it, but is he affecting his voice? And when he goes home and he's like just hanging out or like going through a drive through, that it's like, okay, he's, it goes up another octave. I mean, he's just, <laughs> you know, there is yeah, that yeah, question. I'm just faking my voice. Not, th- I just like, you know, not yeah. three. This is my real, I can't, yeah. But, yeah. but, but, I mean, 
I took your explanation of being that kid who wanted to be older to be in that old soul that it might have been that your voice was something that maybe you've you've settled into something that was an affectation of wanting to be older at a younger age. Did you talk like this before YouTube? Uh, it's funny when you say talk like this because when I wake up, I, when I wake up in the morning, I don't think of me as like someone who talks like this. <laughs> right, that's <laughs> like, my point. Descri- like that, like describe that. Describe what this is. And what that. Is, what, what is this? <laughs> and that. <laughs> that. That's the question. What is the this of Taze on Day? Uh, talk like this. Um, uh, did I talk like this before my voice was deep? Probably. I mean, I, I would assume I was always cerebral, intellectual, reflective, uh aloof to some extent. Well, I, I, I don't mean to go back to the shallow end of the pool here. I'm not trying to to do that uh, by going back to the voice. I was just acknowledging that I think people just, you know, they want to be fascinated to a certain degree and then they just want to believe that, oh, he affects his voice or that's the simplest solution. That's the more entertaining solution, uh, explanation. So, so but you're the knowing almost... you, the message is, this is me, guys. I am a person and... I like to say things and have thoughts and have conversations. And, and I am actually, and, and I'm and not I'm a interested cart- in that. I'm not a cartoon. Not a cartoon. Yeah. And I think you're right. There, there is, that is kind of the struggle that I've always had on YouTube. It's not just a, a struggle of being taken seriously, but it kind of is. Uh, for whatever reason, me and my natural state uh, on camera as I present myself on YouTube people don't know whether to believe that is real. They don't know whether to believe that's a real person whom they can have a relationship with. They they can't imagine when they watch Chocolate Rain sitting next to me on the bus. How does that make you feel about opportunities that are gonna continue to come for the rest of your life for you to be that guy that people laugh How? at? On the internet. Um, You know, I just like to say that I am passionate about working. I don't really complain about the context because I'm old enough and wise enough to know that any type of exposure, including good natured humor, is exposure that, you know, if 10,000 people watch it, maybe two people will be watching that who then initiate a serious relationship where they get to know me. And maybe that's a work relationship. Maybe that's something that's very serendipitous. And so exposure is ultimately king. And, uh, and the money's still green, right? I mean, I guess you see. I mean, I, I'm I, I guest starring in a couple episodes of uh, what is it on, on Adult Swim now, the Jack and Triumph show, uh, which is uh, very fun, very fun to be on set. I love acting, and like if I had a choice of what to do with my career, I love being on sets. I love the lights, the camera, having a crew uh, in my face. I love being cast and 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 embodying a role. Uh, I just, I love it to tears. And one reason I think I love it to tears is because I'm, I'm, I can let go in a fictional space in a way that I cannot let go in real life. And I feel more real acting in a fictional context than I actually do with real people in real life. And, Hmm. uh, that harkens back to the cartoonification of Tazan Day to this sense that when I am actually real in real life and it's not an acting set, Somehow I'm taken as this cartoon. Somehow I'm taken as something that is fantasy and not reality. And so it's almost like uh, when I'm in fantasy, when I am on set, when I am acting, when I am able to actually be a character, I feel more real and more incisive and more on top of my game as a human being than I do anywhere else, including in real life. Well, that's interesting. You know, we wish you the best in acting and everything else that you do, but uh, we appreciate you being real here. I think you certainly yeah. have been real here. <laughs> we and, do appreciate uh, So that. thanks for creating this ear biscuit. Uh, uh, thanks, thanks for that. Thank now, you so much for having me. And there you have it, our chocolate biscuit <laughs> with chocolate covered biscuit. with, with Tay's on Co- dipped and covered and smothered in chocolate rain. Uh, let Tay know uh, that you appreciated his ear biscuit with us. You can do that using hashtag ear biscuits at his Twitter Tay's on Day T A Y Z O N D A Y. Uh, I really appreciated. I mean, this is what I'm going to tweet. Okay. Hey man, thanks for uh, 
for being so open and so introspective. You know, mm-hmm. I, I'm glad that he was willing to go there and you know, I mean, he's, I think it was clear that he had thought about his experience, but I do feel like maybe we brought him back to it and helped him process it in one place. I, I, I like to feel like we've done that at least, even, <laughs> even if no one's listening, like you are listening and I, I'm glad you're listening, but, and I'm not saying it's therapy and I'm not saying that Tay needs therapy because that, that would be the wrong thing to say. I'm really digging a hole for you myself. You kinda are, I'm just gonna see how you swim out of this bucket of chocolate rain I, here in a second. <laughs> I just enjoy having conversations with people to get them to process their experience in one sitting, especially when there's kind of lights going off and we're reaching conclusions that maybe they hadn't thought about. But it's not therapy. Yeah, I, you know, I'm not saying that, Tay. It's it, well, I think the thing that we, we've talked to people who ha, who are known for something, uh, and then I mean, ultimately, every YouTuber. Every entertainer ultimately has that thing that most people recognize them for, right? I mean, there's very few people that have this this really even-handed body of work. This everybody has the thing that they they broke out with. Uh, he happens to be he he is such a right place, right time, 2007, uh, unintentional, so big, like all the. You, you don't think that if if he if Chocolate Rain hadn't existed until tomorrow. And it hit no. the internet no. that it wouldn't work? No, I know it would work, but it wouldn't be, it would not be the sensation that it was. It, I, I, be, I believe that it had to do with a time in which people were thirsty for chocolate rain and, th- I don't know. and things like that. I don't, I, I, people are still as thirsty today. I think that, um, I, I'm trying to think of the other people that we've talked to who had started with some unintentional success. I think there were a number of ear biscuits. Uh, the only one that's coming to mind is Glozell, though. I, I'm interested to go back and listen to that one. Yeah, because you know she kind she was she was doing a character, but then it was so there was some intentionality to it, just like there was with what Tay was doing. But it but it blew up in a way that she didn't anticipate. Yeah, and well, she had to react. And to that's it. and that and that's the interesting thing because we're not talking unintentional in the way like okay, you were filmed uh, falling into a fountain, right. And you became super famous for it. No, no. He created a piece of art. He created something that people authentically like for all because of all the, the intentional decisions he made. That's the wonderful the thing. The unintentional consequences of intentional decisions. When you describe the elements of chocolate rain that make chocolate rain great, that's all intentional. But he, like he made the decision to move away from the mic to breathe. He made the decision to put text on the screen, but he didn't necessarily know that that would be that one of the things that made it entertaining for people. So, but, it, and now that, that, I love that dynamic. I love the fact that he understands that that was the mechanism that created it, yet he still can't calculate it. He can only channel it. Like, I, th- I think that was, you know, when he talked about his sense of humor in the tweets, like, well, when I try to be funny, it, it might come across as creepy, but, um, when I'm just putting something out there, people are gonna respond to, I kinda have to trust that it. I'm gonna un- unintentionally create something through intentionally trying to do something else. I'm gonna intentionally do something unintentional. Right, well I think what you're saying, Link, is that you can't make it chocolate rain, but when it does chocolate rain, <laughs> you can so take good. it and use it you can to your advantage. Up. I mean, even in the song biscuit we we did, I mean, you were reviewing the edit and describing to me that the phenomenon of kind of letting him loose at the end of the song there. I believe that it was, for me personally, the most entertaining uh, song biscuit to date. And the most entertaining part for me was the end where Tay takes the lead and we kind of move into the background and just repeat a line over and over again and he just kind of goes to a Tay's on day place, signature holding up of both hands at the same time, um, the facial expression, the tone, <laughs> It was a the, privilege the, to be the, there. The melody choices. That. Yes, it was great. It was, uh, you know, I hope you'll enjoy that. You know, you can put a, a song biscuit on top of your ear biscuit and make a biscuit sandwich. I don't we, know. We, we, could, we could analyze our, our experience forever. We're going to keep doing that, uh, but you are free uh, to move along with the rest of your life or to the near, next ear biscuit and just keep listening. Maybe you're on a road trip. We see, we see those tweets. I'm, I'm getting on a plane. I'm, I'm, I'm downloading a whole bunch of ear biscuits. Whatever you do, uh, you can count on us to keep uh, 
baking the biscuits for yeah. you. Sheet by sheet. On a weekly basis. Just like chocolate rain. <laughs>